Hi, OpenXML developers. This is Eric White. This is another screencast in a series of screencasts that introduces OpenXML word processing ML. In this screencast and in the next screencast, I'm going to examine word processing ML tables, and I'm going to examine them in a lot of depth. There are mainly three scenarios where you need to deal programmatically with word processing ML tables. The first case is where you need to generate a document that contains some tables. That's an interesting case. That's probably the most common of the cases. The second case where you need to deal programmatically with OpenXML word processing ML tables is where you need to extract information from those tables. I've seen applications where, as part of the workflow in the application, the application generated a number of OpenXML word processing ML documents, and in those documents were tables, and the end user was expected to go through and look at each one of these documents and adjust values in those tables, and when everything was exactly as they wanted them to be, they ran another process, and this process would go into all of those word processing ML documents and extract that data from those tables and repopulate the database in their line of business application. The third scenario where you need to programmatically deal with OpenXML word processing ML tables is where you need to render tables. This is probably the most complicated of the three scenarios. It requires the most work. However, it's a pretty important scenario. There are a lot of people who have the need to do very custom rendering of OpenXML word processing ML documents. Till now, there haven't been many options for doing this in a very easy fashion. There is the OpenXML viewer that's on CodePlex, and that's interesting, but it's an XSLT transform, and it's pretty involved if you're really going to get into it and understand exactly what's going on inside of that transform. I've published an HTML transform on my blog. I published it some time ago. That one isn't bad, but it's not high fidelity. It doesn't really render word processing ML tables in exactly the way that we want to render them. So as part of this series and as part of the screencast series on writing recursive pure functional transformations of XML, in the end, we're actually going to write a pretty high fidelity transform of OpenXML word processing ML to HTML that is styled with CSS. This will be an interesting chunk of code that you can take and customize for your exact scenario. So let's dig into tables. In this screencast, I am going to talk about the structure of the markup of tables in OpenXML Word Processing ML. I'll show you how tables are laid out, and I'll explain some of those elements and attributes that you'll see in OpenXML Word Processing ML tables that you might not understand. They aren't necessarily intuitive when you first look at them. But once you understand what they're for, it's pretty easy. First thing let's do is let's create a little table and go in and look at some markup. I'll insert a little two by two table. I'll put a single character into each cell just so that we can see what's going on there. Another thing that I'm going to do here is I am going to make the first row a little bit taller so we can see how that affects the markup. I'll save it, close it. I'm going to drag and drop this onto Visual Studio and we're going to examine it in the Visual Studio OpenXML Package Editor Power Tool. We'll look at the main document part. I'll format the XML and let's go look at the table markup. Here we can see the WTBL element. 
one thing that we'll notice right off the bat is that there's a particular pattern that we'll see with regards to the properties that this TBL element has a child element named TBLPR, in other words, the table properties. If we drop down here, we'll find the TR element, which is the table row element, and we'll find below that that it has TRPR, or in other words, the table row properties. And there we can see that TR height element, where we change the height of our row. And further dropping down below the table row, we can find the TC, which is the table cell element. And in the TC element, it has a child element called TCPR, in other words, the table cell properties. The first thing that we'll take a look at is we can see a number of widths in this markup. We can see down here in the table cell that there's this TCW element. This is the table cell width, and it has this value, 4788, and the type is DXA. And up in the table properties, we'll also see this TBLW element with a value of zero and a type of auto. And we can also see some widths down here in this TBL grid element with the child grid call elements, and there are widths in there. So the question is, what are the units of measure for all of these widths? There are basically two units of measure that you can use in these widths. You can express widths in terms of TWIPs, which are 1 20th of a point, or you can express widths in terms of percentages. And let's take a look at those two things. Now, if you are familiar with the measurement of a point or the unit of measure of a point, then you know that there are 72 points in an inch. So if a TWIP is 1 20th of a point, then we can take 72 and multiply it by 20, and we find out that there are 1,440 TWIPs in an inch. So if you're generating a table, you may very well want to explicitly control how wide each of the columns are. Let's create a new document that will be better suited for changing these column widths, at least for our purposes. And this time I'm going to create a table with two rows and three columns. And we want to generate a table where the first column is one inch wide, the second column is one inch wide, and the third column is two inches wide. So let's go in and let's modify the markup to make that happen. First thing I'm going to do is make the first cell be 1440, and the second cell also will be 1440, and the third cell will be 2880. Now in the second row, we have 1440, 1440, and 2880. And we need to come back up here and we need to change the width of the table. So 1440 times 4 is equal to 5760. So I'm going to change the width of the table to 5760. And I'm going to change the type to DXA. I'm going to do something here Right now, I'm going to delete this TBL grid element. I'll explain what that element is about here in just a bit. There we've made our changes, and let's open our Word document. And sure enough, we have the situation where the table is four inches wide. The first column is one inch, second column is one inch, and the third column is two inches wide. Now, the next thing that we can do is we can change these column widths to express them in terms of percentages. By default, these percentages are expressed in 1 50th of a percent if you just put in a value. So let me show you what I mean by that. I'll change this to PCT. And for this one, I am going to make the first column be 15% of the width of the table. The second column also will be 15% of the table, and the third column will be 70% of the table, therefore adding up to 100%. So I can 
take 15 and multiply it by 50, so I get 750. And the third column will have a value of 3,500, which means that it will be 70% of the width of the table. Now up here at the top, I've still left the width of the table to be four inches. We'll leave it as that for now. Let's save that and open up our document. And sure enough, we can see that the first two columns are about 15% of the width of the table and the remainder, the third column is 70% of the width of the table. So now I'm going to make this table take up 75% of the page, excluding the margins. So I'll take 75 and multiply that by 50, and I get 3750. I'll set this value to 3750. So now we've got a table that is taking up 75% of the page. The first column and the second column are taking up 15% of the width of that table, and the third column is taking up 70% of the width of that table. And that's exactly what we see when we open up the document. These percentages can be expressed in two different ways. I can either express them in 1 50th of a percentage. In other words, you have to take the percentage that you want and multiply it by 50. Or I can express it as a percentage value. So let's change this to 90%. So now, the table is going to take up 90% of the available width of the page and the values down below, we'll change these just so that we can see that we can use that same approach for both. Change this one to 15% and this one, why not, we'll change it to 25% and then that would mean that the third column needs to take 60%. Now we've got 15, 25, and 60 for the column widths, and the table is going to take up 90%. And that's exactly what we get. So there are two ways that you can express values in percentages. One thing I'll show you is I'll make a little change here so it'll force Word to save it. I'll come back here and reload it. And you will see that Word actually changes the values to express them in 1 50th of a percentage and not use the percent sign in the width. So the width of the entire table is 4,500 and the width of the first cell is 750 and the width of the second cell is 1,250. So with those different units of measure, and with the ability to specify the width for the entire table and the ability to specify the width for a particular cell, you pretty much have the ability to create tables that look like what you want them to look like. One interesting point about this is that Word does its best, or any consumer does its best with the values that you supply here. But if you supply values that don't make sense, in other words, if there is a different width for a particular cell in the first row and a different width for a particular cell in the second row in the same column, Word will do whatever it wants to with regards to that. One interesting thing is that you can see that we have this paragraph element underneath the table cell element, the TC element. And this paragraph, it's block level content. And as far as I know, you can put any type of content here that you can put under the body element. So in other words, this 
TC element, it's a block level content container. That's the type of element that it actually is. And we can put any type of block level content under that. And let me show you. So here I am going to insert some random text. I'm going to insert uh, one paragraph with five sentences in it. There we've got that. And I can come over here and I can even insert a text box. I can make it wrap square with the text. I can drag it right over here. This text box is in this cell. I'll show you that in just a minute. And also I can come over here and I can insert a table directly in that cell. So just as you can with HTML, you can have tables within cells. If we save it and come back over here into our markup, here's our first row. Here's our first cell, and you can see that sure enough, that text box is there in this first cell. The markup is literally in that cell. And if we drop down to the second cell, we can see that underneath the table cell element, we have another table element, and that table element now has all of its appropriate child elements. Well, that's all I'm going to cover in this screencast. Thanks for watching. Talk to you next time.